Hello and welcome back to UBF Deep Dive episode four. I'm Abs. I'm Thomas. And today, special guest in the same uniform, funnily enough. Yeah. You, you would think it's filmed on the same like, day. All our guests seem to do the same thing where they just rock up again in the same clothes and I'm like, do you not have another chance? Yeah, I slept in my car. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. You came back the next morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Commitment, guys. Isn't that what you guys did? Because you're also dressed the same. Oh, shit, fair point. We no, haven't no, been caught I've out got, before that. I, no, no, no. I've got seven Mbappe jerseys. I'll just change them between oh, them. Oh, yeah, my God. He's number yeah, seven yeah. as well. Good one. Yeah. Great car. Guys, today we thought of an, the best topic we could mm. with the guests that we had on. Women in sport and the mm. sort of sport in Rome and how that's developed over, developed around women. I yeah. like say it. That. Yeah. yeah no, and, and I think especially with your experience and what you've been able to achieve in in the media, in the media realm with, with sport, and we thought we'd talk about that. And I'll, I'll kick it off with a few things, and we'll go back and forth, and we'll talk about a few few women in sport that have actually achieved greatness yep. and, and have been trailblazers and led the way for this current generation. So He's worded this very nicely, by the way. He's very proud of it. <laughs> yeah. So from Sam Kerr to Kathy Freeman to Elise Perry to Erin Mullen, these are all women in this country who have stepped in front of the limelight to represent women in sport. So whether that be on the field, on the track, in front of the camera, or on the pitch, they all had a part to play. They all have different stories. Kathy, Kathy Freeman, the first Aboriginal Australian woman to win gold at an Olympic event in a historic 400 metre sprint, leading a generation that followed for not just sprinters, but all women in sport. Yeah, Elise Perry. Elise Perry, having debuted both for both the national women's cricket team and also played for a national soccer team at the age of 16. She's the youngest Australian to ever play for both international teams. Uh, her acclaimed cricket cricket's career uh, is proven to be, and acclaimed by some people, as the greatest cricketer in female cricket history. Sam Kerr, needless to say, we all know her. She's arguably the greatest footballing product this country has ever produced, male and female. She has busted down the doors and windows for the current generation, and she has written history all over the world. 314 games, 305 goal, goal contributions, and counting. Last but not least... Erin Mullen, and I know this one, you know, we're both, it, hits, it hits close to home. So she was one of the first women to put her face in front of the camera in a male-dominated sport. She debuted on the footy show, which for the best part of 30 years was the definition of a testosterone-dominated sport and a testosterone-dominated show. From Fatty Vorden to Daryl Broman to Peter Sterling, the Chief, the Falcon, Michael Slater, and even Bo Ryan, it was dominated by strong personalities and predominantly male hosts. On came Erin Mullen. And you best believe she took that host seat. And what what is? It was a ruckus of negativity. The reaction she received and what she copped is more than what the average person will be able to take. And credit to her, she fought through. You know, she trailblazed her way. And she's led the way for a lot, a lot of female hosts that have now taken that main host seat. Some names you can throw out there. Hannah Hollis. You've got Yvonne Sampson. Mel McLaughlin. Tara Rushton. Lara P. Emma Friedman. And now we see... People like Kat Haddad, you've got Kat Sasso, Sam Yeoman, Michelle Escobar on social media, on TV. And Erin Mullen had a big part to play to that and, and she copped a lot of flack. But when we say trailblazer, I think in terms of sports media, she is a big, big part to play. Led the way. Led the way. Kat, Whoa. what's your sort of... That was beautiful, by the way. <laughs> I told you. you. He's, and he's when you said my name, I was like, goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> he's very good with his words. What's your sort of thought on that and how did... Uh, pulsating figure like Erin Boland sort of when you see a person that you can relate to obviously being a woman yourself Mm. how can you does she sort of inspire you at all do you want to give us sort of background on your sort of sports media journey absolutely I think look for me first off I grew up just loving sport and I didn't take a traditional route by any means for this career and I still don't think it's traditional what I do day to day is probably still weird to some people but um I, I think I always just had this burning desire within me to pursue a sports role of some kind and working in broadcast and creating content in this space. And I never knew what exactly what that would look like. Definitely growing up, you know, we were, I'm, I'm similar age to Sam Kerr, right? So the same way Sam Kerr was a trailblazer for footballers as anyone growing up in and around the sport, there weren't a whole lot of females to look at um and to look up to and I'm a big believer in if you can see it you can be it and for a long time it was kind of just imagining the the potential of what could be as opposed to seeing someone like myself Mm -hmm. on camera or whatever it might be but I would say 
from the Aaron Molan perspective, it's an in- interesting question because I saw that as the least desirable role ever. Like be, to be in. I agree. <laughs> and, and I mean that more in the sense of, and you worded it perfectly, that no one goes into a role like that and wants to be criticized like that and wants to be thrown into an environment, thrown into a pit of fire. Let's just be real. I think it was a really poor move from you know, the broadcaster to throw her into a role like that when they just weren't quite ready. Yeah. And I think, and they being the testosterone <laughs> fueled sport, but I'm doing work now in, in rugby league. And I don't think I've ever felt more welcomed with open arms into a new project wow. and into a and into a sport conversation yeah. like I have with rugby league. I've always found football to be quite difficult. You know, you can yeah. come across some really toxic uh, people and I mean that in the nicest way it's it's just passion yeah. but sometimes you know when you don't represent something that they yeah. want to listen to you're met with a lot of animosity whereas in the rugby league space I haven't felt that just yet passion can be twisted with ego exactly and, and that's that's the exactly. thing that causes and that that'll that'll, that'll probably come at some point and cool that's a sign of growth but no I think what you just said is so beautiful and poetic but I think it's also such a reminder of how far we've come yeah. and you know, I'm, I'm, I love what I'm doing and where I'm at, but there's so much more that I want to achieve. But I think, what do you want to achieve? Like, do you have sort of like a goal, like a year goal, five year goal? To, is is there sort of, have you reached your peak yet? Oh, absolutely not. No. I hope I haven't. Um, it's like if I if I have <laughs> touch wood, some <laughs> tough <laughs> some tough uh, nights ahead of me. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think for me. I visualise myself in in a more serious broadcasting role. And I think, like I said, the more that I'm doing in the rugby league space, the more I feel inclined to kind of pursue Mm. something like that. But I think that's just because it's so – it feels more achievable in Australia. Like let's be be completely real here that football, as in soccer, is constantly competing with mainstream rugby league, AFL, cricket, the sports that – are freely available on our major broadcasters versus the sports that are that are behind a paywall. And because of that, there's a lot of opportunity around that. Yeah. And I think, so for me, I, you know, I'd love to pursue a broadcasting role in one of those, but I think fo- football will always be my one love, my yeah. first love. And so to be able to do more in that space is super important to me awesome. as well. Yeah, and, and I completely agree with you there. And I think as well, once you see, once you break down football in Australia, you look at women's football and men's football, you kind of see that women's football is a lot more closer to home. Mm. I'm starting to get that feeling now than men's is. And just going out to a game and involving ourselves and what we've been able to do in that women's football realm this past, say, two months or so, it's made it feel like you have a place there, you have a home there, and, you know, you feel like there's a lot more potential to do things like that. Yeah, to get in and around the community. Yeah. Yeah, whereas the men's one, like you said, you're competing with Europe. And... Let's be honest here, it's it's very much, as it is with all sports, it's a monopoly when it comes to the opportunities mm. as you talk yeah. about and, and opportunities for, for women in that sport. Mm. But, you know, like we mentioned, I think Yvonne Sampson, Hannah Hollis, you know, Danica Mason, another yeah, one. Yeah, Danica for me is, is a huge, yeah, I look at what she's doing and I'd love to be. She's inspiring. Doing something like that. And I think also like the authenticity play and mm. being yourself. And yeah. Yvonne, Yvonne is like that too. Yeah. I've, She's just so organic and authentic was, yeah. and there's nothing about – you feel like you're seeing the same Yvonne that if you ran into at a coffee shop. That's the version of her that <laughs> you, you get. S- did you see her at the cricket? I don't no. know if you saw that video. There was her just oh, – at the – like as in presenting at the cricket? No, 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 no. There was, she was just watching a game on – Oh, no, weekend. I didn't see this. Uh, I think she was just sitting there and she was like scratching her head or like, you know, scratching her nose or whatever it is and they finally got her on camera and they gave her a call and then it was just herself. Like she's being her. How good. And so you and you could and you could see it from day one on the footy show. Yeah, you could see that that is her. She's not necessarily out and about. She's genuine. Yeah, and I think I'm so happy that Fox Sports mm. snapped her up and put her in that position because she was Me one of too. those that deserved it. And I don't think her and Erin could have been in the same. They're two women who deserved that. Yeah, that they're their spot own spotlight. The yeah. yeah. And considering the growth of that, not just not necessarily on the media side, but actually on the pitch, the mm. growth of the women's game rugby league, AFL, uh, football, as you were saying, is it as simple as just streaming it more, giving it more money? How do you maintain this growth, possibly even make it better? Mm, It's generational. I think all sport is generational. Growth is generational. Uh, The same way that, you know, there was a 50-year period 
in history where football didn't exist for women. It yep. wasn't something that we could be played. Yeah. That naturally means we are 50 years behind the men's game. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think you can achieve – you can't speed up that process. No. You have to give it the time. And I'm a strong believer that where there is quality, money will follow, but also you need some money to create quality. Sure. So there is this necessity for funding on a broadcasting level down to grassroots football yep. level. You know, you need to see investment, yep. but – the more investment you have, the more quality you produce and then only good things can come from that. But I think, you know, the Women's World Cup is the perfect case study for us yeah. of a legacy that has now been created and that is not just in football, that's in every women's sport. For me and I think all of the members of UBF can agree, that was the best thing that's happened to sport in this country, yeah. I think. Sport, men's, women's, any sport, that was the best thing that's happened besides yeah. the Olympics for me. Yeah. You're Croatian, so you grew up in a passionate footballing household yeah. – you don't see that same kind of passion when you God, no. are outside of your house, God, right? It's, it's only the early days of the RBB that I saw, saw that. Yeah. The early days. And then, you know, things p were put in place to kind of stop that, yep. which is unfortunate. And that's of part of the problem as well is fair. And we, you literally just said it, with passion comes ego and all of these things. But you've got to kind of accept that with passion can come – less than desirable things, but yeah. you can't have one without the other. Of course. Yeah. But you can't keep shutting down the passionate side of things. But um, I think the Women's World Cup was that opportunity to show passion and to get excited and jump on a bandwagon and, and everyone got around it and, and it left a legacy. And it's also giving it a different light as well because even when you look at the Women's Rugby League games, you look at the Tasha Girl Cups, for example. Mm. Like, these women hit hard. <sighs> Thomas, stronger than me. Thomas, no, no. If if some of those if some of them actually you ran straight at them, they would flatten you and you would you'd barely be surviving with groups. That's how hard they put hit. it this way. I would be used as the ball. They will throw me, brother. Go on, finish. No, no. God. That, like, goal post, goal post. <laughs> <laughs> I build like a goal post, some people say as well. I'm quite like this. <laughs> so that, look, all, all jokes aside, like the quality of the game in women's sport in this country has gone from, from one level to another. And like you said, where quality is money follows. It's just a matter of can you know the funding of the government and all of that start to actually pump in the money. Mm. But what I'm kind of liking about our women's league, especially in football, is it's the opposite of the A-League. We're almost becoming a destination now for foreign players mm. to come here due to the quality. More than the, men oh, more more than than the men's leagues, yeah, 100%. Sure. A, to begin with, obviously, you've got the salary caps in, in the A-League and the women's league and all of that. But at the same time, the fact that the women's game isn't as infiltrated with money and finances as the men's game is. It's more pure. It's more pure. So, for example, you look at... Um, uh, sorry, Hannah Keane from Western United. Yeah. Signed her from the US. And she's come in and she's taken it by storm. You know, you look at a lot of the Sydney FC and team. She, look, I've spoken to her a couple of times. Yeah. She, um, she speaks so highly of her experience here, wow. playing here, and kind of the reasoning for coming over. It's an opportunity thing for them. And um, they have to, to be considered for the national team, you have to be doing something. You of can't. Course. Yeah. And I think she saw that and, and took the opportunity and started running with it. And she's really, really found a place here. And she came back. She was on pretty sure loan for yeah, the first season. Loan. And she had the opportunity to come back and stay permanently. And she took I it think, with And I think she she requested it. Like she really, really wanted to come back. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And and it goes back to that purity of our the women's game here. I'm telling you, you go out to any of those games. You see it. There's passion. And, and you could tell that, you know, the fans are there for the football. They're not just coming there for it's not a social event. Like, there's passion. There's love for the of game. Of course, 100%. And like I said, until money infiltrates it, which I hope it doesn't, mm. we're going to get that. And I think... But as Kat was saying, it's, a du it's the sort of the double-edged sword. You need yeah. money to make it grow. Mm. But at the same time, you run that risk that the... Money that in the right areas, though. That's the thing where yeah. we have an opportunity with the women's game to kind of fix where we went wrong with the men's game. Well, these are the numbers that I sort of want to give out to both of you. From the Clearinghouse of Sport 2023 statistics, 32% of Australian women aged 15 and above participate in sport-related sport related activity at least once a week. Mm. Only 32. For me, that's a bit surprising after the Women's World Cup that we've had. Mm. So I think money in that area can go. And one that really sh sh stood out to me was 46% 40, of Australian girls aged between 1 to 14 participated in organised outside of school hours, sport-related activities once a week. So almost half. Almost half. Yeah. Wow. So but 
for me though, it's like you got the. It's also that drop off at fourteen. Like there's so and and what's I. What's the reasoning for that? I you, think it honestly, it's puberty. It's getting to an age where like your body's changing. You don't want to be training the way that you were before, or maybe you don't feel as aligned with like whatever it was you were doing before. But mm-hmm. I know for me. Also with school, I got to an age where even just fitting and training and stuff was getting really, really difficult. Mm-hmm. And the sports also cost you money. Yeah. Especially, you know, we've, country. we've yeah. picked, we've all picked to play a sport that's not cheap. Yep. Mm. And that's part of the problem too. And Claude's is, you know, Claude Fabiano for yep. those at home yep. is, um is someone who will constantly, you, you can have a great conversation with him about the cost of mm. playing football in Australia and how, it's just like chalk and cheese when you compare we it to of, other yeah. countries. With, with, when we had Claude's on the podcast, we sort of alluded to that as well. Mm. And these, it's like Queensland's, they've got participation rates for only 300 bucks. Yeah. Th- that's the cap. I think yeah. we saw that they, even then it's like 150, uh, their registration. Yeah. Like I think when we saw our breakdown this yes. year, the, the Football Association of Queensland is only 120, 150 dollars mm. for an adult. It's an amazing. I think it's 50 bucks for a mini yeah. roo and then. Stop. Yeah. Whereas here you're paying Two and a half for, for NPL teams. That's great. Yeah. It's I want I want to raise a question. So we've seen the rise of players. You know, you have got Sam Kerr, who's you know half half Indian, half Australian background. Mary Fowler, PNG Irish. You got the Dos Santos sisters out at Sydney. They're Portuguese. You know, you look at players like uh, El Abdul Masih, Middle Eastern background, and even personalities in the media now. As we mm. talked about yourself coming from, you know, you got a mixed background. You got Lebanese. You got Irish. You said you were Egyptian as well. Mm. Um, and you look at, you know, Kat Sasso, Michelle Escobar, they're, they're all, let's just call them non-Anglo names, mm. s- last names that are representing football, are representing women. What does that do for young women that actually want to pursue a career, that want to see, you know, mm. I've got a very Lebanese Muslim Muslim name and, you know, to do something like this for me, you know, mm. I can understand why sometimes it's like, okay, might not fit in, might not. Mm. What does that do for young women that, see that as a barrier yeah i mean i think it stops it being a barrier yeah uh once again if you can see it you can be it it's so um cliche but it really is true i think do you know what what's fascinating for me is almost thinking back to what it was that gave me the confidence to play the sport Mm. but then also go you know what i could maybe work in this for me the playing was bend it like beckham Mm. it was seeing an indian girl Mm. playing football i remember that movie I related more with the Indian girl than I did with the, you know, white English girl. Yep. I'm not Indian, but it's something that eth- <laughs> ethnic people can just yeah. relate well, with, no, you know. 100%, 100%. It's the involvement of the family. It's understanding that, you know, on a weekend you've got family obligations and trying to work your sport around all of that. And I think she, just Jasminda, made sp- the, the sport look like it was something that I could do and it's yep. a conversation I could have with my parents. And I actually watched Ben like back. Beckham with my mum. Wow. And I remember she was just like, oh, it's cool, you know, because I grew up in a netball environment. Everyone I knew played netball and I thought it was a disgusting sport and yeah. I stand by that. <laughs> and um, I'm so sorry if you play netball. That's okay. <laughs> just, But it's like just, just bounce the ball and play basketball. Um, but I just never felt like I belonged in that sport. Yeah. And then I'd see my brother playing soccer and i'm like mum that's what i want and there were no girl teams so she had to enroll me i was the only girl for about three years and then another two girls joined from my primary school because we're talking like eight nine ten years old and i got to be friends with all the boys and and i was such a tomboy growing up but it was such a unique dynamic and i think for my mum too to get used to that right she was like oh got a daughter that wants to do what my son's doing and that's a bit weird for her but then she got used to it and now it's so normal Yeah. yeah but um Seeing that film was very impactful for me. I, I know, I know exactly what you mean, and I can, I, like, for me, I can speak from a cultural yeah. background. It's kind of like I worked. I just left the job. I worked in Cronulla for two years. I know exactly where this is going. And look, I, I thankfully the experience I had wasn't, you know, nothing like two thousand and five. Um, but when it comes to what I saw, what I dealt with, it's understanding di- little different things like. You know, have like you said, having your family over every second day, and you having to be there, having to yeah. help out here. Well, you know, having extra people in the house. Like we've, I've worked with one person, the only other ethnic person there. You know, her mum lived with her, mm. and she's got a kid, and she's got a husband in the house, and understanding little things like that to people who won't get it, yeah. and it's like it almost makes you sometimes feel 
different. You're, you're different, but yeah. it's it's actually just that our culture plays so correct. Our culture ripples into every aspect of your life. Yeah. Yeah. It plays into your work. It plays into how you carry yourself. It plays into the time that you have to be home. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so I think it's just one of those things where, like I said, if you can see it, you can be it. And I. I'm very – I feel very grateful that I have created – not created, but I, I feel like there's a little community now around me of young women with Arab surnames who are emerging in the rugby league and in the in the yeah. football space and I interact with them and I engage with them and I'm supportive of them and I know them all by name because they've reached out and they've said to me, you know, this is what I want to do and seeing an Arab name doing these yep. things yeah. makes me feel like I can do it. So for me, it's not that I can see someone with an Arab surname doing what I want to do. It's that um, I want to keep doing this so that they can see me doing it. Yeah, and and, and it plays a big part. And like when we originally reached out, the first thing I told you, and I've told a lot of, you know, any sort of Lebanese or Middle East and think because – I know how hard it is, mm. like, and, and I can't speak from a female's point of view, but I know how hard it is from a cultural point of view to step out and do things like this. Mm. And, like, even putting your name out there, the amount of times I've considered using an alias name. Mm. Uh, well, I, I joke around, I call it Montgomery. Um, That's an interesting choice. Yeah, I was going to go with AJ, but I'm like, I'll spice it up a bit. Um, I don't know how you go from AJ to Montgomery, <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> Start of the alphabet to the middle of it. Look, right all, all jokes aside, it's it's not easy, mm. and it's taken that first step and just owning it. Mm. And I think at the end of the day, owning who you are, and you can't really necessarily change that. And it's just about to, to just add to your point. It's just about sort of finding someone that you can relate to, mm. Mm. and w- whether you like it or not, I'm sure you could be absolutely proud of it, is that you are sort of that on a lesser scale at the moment. Mm. That sort of Aaron Mole. Mm. You sort of are. Mm. where you've got this little, I'm not going to call it a fan group, but you've got this little sort of cult following behind you that you sort of inspired and started mm. and now you're sort of leading that way. Mm. And that's a, it's a massive, like as I've told Anthony, it's a, obviously a different role to you, but it's a massive sort of responsibility that you have and mm. I'm sure you you enjoy that challenge and it's that's, that's what sort of we're trying to do. So for myself, uh, with the Croatian people, I can't speak from a female uh, point of view, obviously, and for Abdul from a from a Lebanese Muslim, sort mm. of, we're, mm. we're sort of trying to be those those voices. that bridge, correct? Those yeah. voices. Yeah. Again, even the area I'm from, mm. from Greenacre, like how often do you see? It's like you know they joke around the little boy from Rosario type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> the little boy from Greenacre. The little boy Green from Greenacre. <laughs> like I've literally lived in that area. Like I've lived in Bankstown, Punchbowl, Greenacre my whole life. Mm. You don't see it. We had Hazm. Mm. growing up and you know i think going back to what thomas said you're playing a big part yeah i know other people so name of her that and it's mm. kind of like you know you're you're setting you're trailblazing it for them mm. and and especially for our community and it means a lot for our community like i've got a 10 year old sister mm. so i've she, she follows you by the way that's oh my gosh that's so cute stop <laughs> i'm gonna cry nah, she's she's that so, like it makes the biggest and as you said it you see someone and you're like they're like me yeah mm. it's as simple as that i think it's it's so important and am i actually doing a talk tomorrow um with football australia at yeah. the soccer is lebanon game so for context my mum is born in australia but her background is irish but obviously she identifies as being australian yep. so i've grown up with a lot of australian influences on her side and then my dad's lebanese born in beirut um you know i've got family in the middle east in egypt like you you mentioned so for me tomorrow is a really important game because it's kind of like the mum versus dad derby right are you gonna wear a half half shirt yeah, should I? <laughs> but um, Football Australia asked me to host a QA and a with um, an agency called Cultural Pulse who did a lot for the Women's World Cup around uniting, you know, diverse voices and bringing together all of these different cultural communities around Australia who didn't know how to get in and around the Women's World Cup. So, yeah. like, if you were Brazilian, they would help you get to a Brazil game. Yep. Um, so it's really exciting for me tomorrow to be sitting on a, a panel talking about what it means to be Lebanese and Australian and yeah. using my voice for things like that. But for me, that's like a, what's the word? Like when I reflect on where I've come from and doing things like that tomorrow, it's, a milestone. it's, a milestone. It, it's, it's, it's just a really nice opportunity to see also that the multicultural voice is being appreciated more and more and more. And I think it's a really good time as a multiracial person, as a biracial person to be pursuing a career like this because our voices are becoming more important and I think people are starting to appreciate what a Croatian voice means to the game, what a Lebanese voice means to the game. Yeah. 
what any other voice means to the game. It's not just about Australia. It's all the cultures that make up Australia. And and I think like we're, you know, you know I could probably speak on your behalf as well. We're very fortunate to have supportive parents. Mm. You know, at the end of the day, once I brought up the, this idea on the podcast and everything to talking to my parents about it, they're supportive. They got behind it. That's great. And, you know, I think we need to take bits of that for that next generation. So when I'm, I was talking to my sister a couple of weeks ago, I'm like, oh, I want to start taking her to more, you know, women's Definitely games. Definitely do that. Well, straight away she starts, because she's into a footy, like her NRL. Mm. She starts looking into the she women's. She's a doggies fan as well. Yeah. Oh, Shadow Cars, her favourite player. Oh, that's nice. Uh, every time they come to Roberts Park, she goes over and she's like, oh, look, I got Matt Burden to sign me. So. Oh, that's the best. The only thing I know about rugby league is a Burden bomb. Burden bomb. That's not a bad thing to know. Yeah. That's all I know. It's I, th- I think it's one of those, like, you know those weird obscure facts? Yeah. I think that's the only thing I know about rugby league. I'll, I'll teach you a few things. Okay. Back on Off the our, podcast. Well, back on to our point. Um, like, she automatically went and looked up the Matildas and she's like I want to go to a game with Sam Kerr there and I, I wish I was joking like she genuinely came back to me she was think like, of that 20 years ago unheard of it's, it's crazy and then and like I said when it, when it comes for you know the barriers and, and everything that you know young girls deal with you know we won't understand that no, you know, there's, no. there's certain things and certain barriers and it, specific things that you guys have to overcome mm. to get to that point and you know what are these things that you think mm. are I think we're we're still outnumbered in a room. Yep. I've had it's interesting. Nike have been very supportive of my career. Like they, I say, discovered me because I don't know what other word to use. But it was literally an Instagram message about three years ago where they invited me to a Matilda's game where there was like twelve thousand people there. And you look at a game now and it sells out. But 20, that's just twenty minutes. It's the, yeah, that's the difference in yeah. a matter of years. But um, they were always very supportive, and I remember having a conversation with their head of marketing, who was like, "Cat, we." we want to help you with your career. Like we really support you. And I was like, well, support born offside, like get around it. And they were like, we want to support things where you're the voice. Wow. And, I, and I understood where they were coming from. It's not that they were saying born offside isn't a great product and all of that. Like they have supported born offside, but they're so big on giving the women like the center of attention That's and amazing. saying, how yeah. can we make them the main voice rather than being outnumbered in every room? And yeah. I know what they were saying and I've reflected on it more and more and more. And now I'm working on a project where, you know, the male voice is there, but it's not the main voice. And yeah. I'm excited for that new project. And like, I'll hopefully be able to tell you guys about it in a couple of months, but, um, I think that's the new age that we're in and it's it's genuinely just having the confidence, like you said, just being yourself, yeah. knowing that you know what you're talking about. There's so many rooms I walk into and I am literally shaking. Yeah. Like my knees are wobbling because I'm like, what am I doing here? But once you leave that room and you walk out of there and you've had conversations and you've shown people who you are, you realise that you belong there and that there's a reason you're invited there in the first place. Yeah. And all those things are just like so, so, so important. But I think as a female, like I said, it's just knowing that you're more often than not outnumbered in a room. Yeah. And so you have to feel confident. you got to fake it till you make it. I am faking it every day. Yeah getting real good at it to the point where i've convinced myself i'm not faking it anymore <laughs> like i'm actually i'm sweet <laughs> but um I no think laptop no phone no script needed no. ready to go i think i've just gotten used to that yeah. and i think um it's a, it's a it's a version of normal for me you're believing what you're saying at the end of the day yeah and i think that's that's the biggest part and look like i think i'm gonna ask a question i'm gonna give out boards in a minute you know we all grew up and <coughs> especially i'd say about 15 years ago or so there, there were women that stood out to us in mm. sport, especially or in media, um, that I think that, you know, dominated their sport but never got the recognition that they did. I want everyone from a good minute while we talk about something else to think of one female athlete, media, whatever it is, mm-hmm. that they believe inspired them or you feel like captivated your eyes in uh, in their own realm, if you want to. What a that. what a brilliant way to to end off the segment. I, I like it. That. Although, uh, yeah, I think just going back to, to what we said before I handed out the boards. Um, Can I say just Minda from Bend It Like Beckham? <laughs> <laughs> no, Do you know the actor's name? Yeah, Paminda Chadra or something like that. Search it up someone. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, <laughs> no, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I've got someone. So this can be an athlete, a media person. This can be anything. Is that correct? That's yours. Is that correct? It can be athlete, media. Can um, I pass it on? Yeah, pass it. Pass it on. Thank you. That's yours. 
that's your pen. I've got one out. Oh. I've got one out, Yeah, so... I, I just, yeah, it's crazy. Like like you said, like, you know, you come from a similar background to me and I think for me it means, it means you know, say it means a bit more mm. because growing up I never had, mm. you know, people with, you know, Muslim last names or Arab last names or whatever you want to call it. So that's from Hazza. Mm. I didn't have anyone. Mm. So it's 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 inspiring. You know what, this is tough. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. I, I think to this day I don't really have like an Arab idol. Mm. I don't have uh, an Arab surname individual that I look up to, but I definitely have someone and I've got a story Yeah, with it. So. All right, 60 seconds starting now. Bear in mind, my spelling is horrific, so if I get this wrong, this is <laughs> just to let everyone know. And my handwriting is atrocious. All right, abs kick us off, mate. Um, my mom played tennis. Oh, don't you dare, don't. don't. Okay. Um, growing up, I <laughs> watched a lot of tennis with my grandpa. Love tennis. I just do a lot of tennis. You know, Rafael Nadal, <gasps> uh, Roger Federer. I was a Roger Federer boy. I'm Rafael Nadal, through and through. That, that was my grandpa, Rafael Nadal. He loves him. He loves him. Um, Master of the clay court. Yeah. Roland Garros. He was, he was a master of, of a lot, to be honest. Um, but for me, when it came to the women's game, there's one that stood out. And it was Maria Sharapova. Oh, my wow. di- Okay, okay, what's different? I was expecting you to say Serena. Well, that's mine. No. I. <laughs> that's mine. That's yours as well. Will, the Williams sisters in particular. I I'll like tell you. that. Yeah. You go first? Yeah. No, I'll go. Um, for me, with Maria Sharapova, I've always been, you know, I love a good underdog story. And I think that she, a lot of her talents went underrated sometimes mm. because of the presence of, you know, especially your Williams sisters. They were taking it all over. But watching her, seeing how good she was, and I think when we watched the wim- the women's, whatever, whether it was tennis or football back then, we really undermined it. Mm. And you go back and look at what's been created now and what she's kind of trailblazed her way through. For me, she was an icon. You know, when you think of women's athletes 15, 20 years ago, she's the first one that comes to my mind. Mm. And even moments created where I'd sit there and watch the tennis with my granddad, you know, at my grandparents, with my auntie. He loved Sharapova. And and I'm talking like back then a 70, 72, <laughs> 73 year old man watching tennis. And if we even for him to turn around and say, like she's she's bloody good. Yeah. And for me That is a big deal for that generation to admit. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's inspirational. And I think I look I look back at it now and I'm like, it she played a big part. And f- for me, it's the exact same thing with the Williams sisters. For me, sure, we can say all these things that they only play two sets instead of the three, et cetera, et cetera. I think they are so much more talented than what people make them out to be. Mm. The power that uh, Serena had in particular, yeah. Venus was not far behind, yeah. but the power that the Williams sisters had was absolutely incredible. Like I'm talking serves, 170, 160. From I'm sure Serena cracked 200 at some point. I, I, don't, I, would, I wouldn't even doubt yeah. it. She's incredible. Can I liken something? And I, I'm not, not just because of race and all of that. I think I was trying to think of who Lauren James in, in the women's sport reminds me of. Is she is the Serena Williams of Yeah, of uh, that's football. a very good uh, comparison. It's her demeanour as well. <laughs> the, you could stick her against, I, I'm not joking, she could line up at left wing for Chelsea in that men's team. And she just would f- like. Oh, brother, I actually her, would love to see it. Brother, she, she would do a better job than Woodrick. The way the way she, she would do a better job than Woodrick. The way she glides and the way she's able to play mm. reminds me a lot of Serena, where Serena was just dominant. And you could, I swear to God, you could pit her against, you know, the any any male tennis player, and she would give them a go. She mm. might give me a run for the money, Cat. I've got two names. I broke the rules. One is. Because I feel like I didn't allude to this person well enough before when I was talking about my inspirations. Mm. I had Bend It Like Beckham and then I had um, a presenter from the UK called Jules Breach. I mentioned her to you guys before. Jules was connected to me through a mutual friend that once again, things happen for a reason. I was Mm -hmm. just very grateful that we had any connection to each other whatsoever. And she became a bit of a mentor for me when I was really trying to figure out what steps I needed to take mm. to do what I'm doing today. And at the time she 
she's still in the UK, but she'd come over to do a World Cup with Optus Sport and she's really owning it in the UK. And I used to say, Jules, like, what do I need to do to be like you? And she always had the time of day for me. And she always said, I treat everyone the same because one day, you know, the 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 person that is running around getting coffees on set mm. is the executive producer two years later on yeah. a, a on a on a shoot. Very true. And if you didn't treat them very nicely when they're asking what coffee you wanted, they're also not gonna hire you for the main job as the <laughs> executive true. producer. Yeah. And so she taught me a lesson around just how you treat everyone. It doesn't matter what level they're at, mm. just being respectful. So I'm always grateful that I met her and, and all of that. And then Lucy Zelich. Absolute icon. I think anyone who grew up on football and SBS in Australia who's female looks at Lucy and goes, trailblazer. Yeah. yeah. The same way, you know, Erin Mullen was criticised for doing things the way she did it. Lucy Zelich was criticised, you know, for pronouncing names the right way. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a legacy I that yeah. I have, Claude Fabiano has, yeah. you guys have. You yeah. pronounce things with respect the way that they're meant to sound. Um, it's embracing multicultural Australia. It's embracing all the cultures of the world. Yeah. Yeah. But I met Lucy about six months ago at, an, at an event. Chills. <laughs> Absolute chills. And wow. she said, I, I love the work that you've done on SBS oh, and whatever. And I said, yeah. that's it. <laughs> Take <laughs> me now. Take me now. Yeah. But I think the, the trend between these two is the respect yeah. and it's the professionalism and it's, um, those are things that it doesn't matter what level you're at, you approach everything with professionalism and respect and giving everyone the time of day and only good things can happen for you. And I think like that's a message for women, men, it's a message for everyone. What a great way to end it. Yeah. Respect. I think I think <laughs> yeah, you could have you couldn't have summed it up better in brilliant, that sense. That was brilliant. And and I think at the end of the day, you know, when it comes to women in football and women in sport and, and the whole media realm. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're not slowly but surely. We're, we're getting there, and and there's a big part to play. And whether that delves further into background and nationality and race, um, that's to be seen. Mm. I think you know, like we said, coming from our backgrounds, and and you you know, Thomas is welcome from a Croatian background. Mm. We don't always have names that people can spell. We don't. No, but two two cats points. Sorry to cut you off, and then we'll then we'll call it there. But the potential that this has is scary. Mm. It's scary, like to you're one of the first and you've got that crew coming in and it's just going to keep going and going and growing and growing. And soon you're going to look, you're going to look outside. There's going to be 150 people like all eyeing for your job. That's what you want. Mm, because exactly. in the male domain, you've got 15 people eyeing for that one role in the, in the women's at the moment, you probably only have five or six. Yeah. But why not? They are just as talented as the men. You m there's no reason why they can't get there. And it's, the potential yeah. is scary. It's, it's getting it's getting out there. And I and I think today we we found a deeper conversation than just women in football. Mm. I think we delved into it even more, you know, another barrier which is you know, women of race and yeah. and you know, dealing with those type of issues in football as the well. Next deep dive topic. <laughs> uh, look, um, otherwise, yeah. Now look, I think we can leave it there. We have a football somewhere there. Oh yes. Where'd it go? Somewhere. Did it fall? Well done, guys. <laughs> Hold on. Prepared for the guest. Well done. Oh, yeah, get out of your bag. It's fine. Kat, be honest. When, when you walked in, did you think you had any idea of what this I was going to be like? I said this looks so much more professional than anywhere I've ever worked. In oh, I really? appreciate it. Wow. Uh, you guys are you're running a tight ship here. There's a big crew behind the scenes, guys, that are making this happen as well. And it's really, really cool to see um, what you guys are doing and – and I think once again, that's why I'm yeah. here. Is mm. like I, I want to support emerging talent and Massive thank be you, a part of things. And um, look, I don't have a lot of pull, but you know, I think any eyes that you can get on the work that you're doing yeah. is important. Yeah. And I think it's really, you know, you should be commended too for sharing multiple voices. You're looking at so many aspects of the game, yeah. you're making it diverse. You're focusing on the women's as much as the men's, and like that's the future of sport conversations, and I think that's awesome. So, Massive, thank you. Yeah. Well, Have here's the uh, football. He's the sharpie. Love. Do you charge for for autographs these days, Cat? Or oh, I might have to start charging. <laughs> <laughs> we could be the first. <laughs> we'll split a fifty-fifty. <laughs> nah, he bought my dinner. I'm I'm sweet. <laughs> uh, it's if, what a gentleman. If I was hungry, maybe football. I would have charged. Chivalry's not dead, Cat. Look at that. <laughs> oh, I knew when I walked in here it wasn't dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, that absolute by example. Uh, listen, mate, it's the least we could do. We bought Claude's dinner as well, so 
You know, right. when people right. come on, and it's you know, that's it, hundred percent. If we, what are we going to eat with them? Not like we treat them well at UBF. That's it. That's it. Cat, and then you won't put episode six. Episode six. Episode sixteen. Look at that. Um, Matson's coming in on camera. There we go. <laughs> I'm going to put a little X because Love it. I kiss everything. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, guys, thank you so much. Seriously, we have been uh, UBF. Yeah. I have been Thomas. I've been Abs. I've been Kat Haddad. Thank you so much, guys. And we'll get Kat on most definitely shortly. Ciao. Yeah.